what I've been sharing this evening is kind of part two of some training sessions that I've been sitting in over the last few months just on discipleship and evangelism. So, so what I share with you tonight is it's not uh, anything that I put together myself. So, so you know this is going to be good. It came from somebody else, some other source. But I just uh, put it all together so it made sense. And uh, so, so tonight is part two of gather to disciple and scatter to evangelize. Go make disciples. That was a uh, command that Jesus had given, not just his disciples, but the church, the saints, you and I. We are to go. And so the, this is the second part this evening, and, and I'll try and um, get through because I know there is some, some information, and I'll give you an opportunity to gather some paper and a pen because I know there's some little tidbits of gold nuggets in there that uh, you're going to want to search things out yourself. And, and uh, so as we're speaking about discipling and mentoring, I, I just want to give honor to a great elder, uh, Reverend James Fudge, who he, he took me in under his wing and some years ago, and he, he was such a mentor to me. He, he trained me. He discipled me. He corrected me. He instructed me, and uh, I, just, I just loved him, and I loved his ministry, and, and it was such an honor to be a part of his ministry the years that uh, I was um, part of his team. And so I want to give him honor tonight, and I give him the credit for, for my ministry. He's the reason I pursued to be a minister. And uh, I never would have believed so many years ago that I would be at this point in my life. And so one thing I remember that Reverend James Fudge taught me, and it, uh, it was to have the heart of a servant. And it wasn't something he necessarily said, but it's what he lived. And that's one thing he uh, instilled in me is the love, compassion to reach others. And so I just wanted to give him honor this evening. And so it's just a a quick summary of just last week or two weeks ago, I shared with you about in um, Deuteronomy chapter 6 where Moses was sharing with us that we shall diligently teach them. And uh, it was pertaining to our children, but it also can pertain to today where we train up those who we are discipling, mentoring, and that we cultivate that relationship. We do what, we replicate what Jesus did. And, uh, and so often Jesus uh, taught in parables. Like he would use things that would have been common to man with a spiritual application. A lot of times using nature and comparing things to uh, the kingdom of God in ways that, you know, they could relate to at the current situation or, or the need. You know, if you remember, uh, I used the uh, analogy of the muddy cup and of course, I wasn't able to go resurrect some mud today. It's just like everything is frozen. So it'd just be more like ice. So um, I was going to try and do that again, but I wasn't, uh, wasn't quick enough before everything went to the freeze. So, um, so we're just I was thinking about parables. And there's a parable that came to my mind, and it's found in Mark chapter 4. So if we could uh, bring up the, the slide number 2. And so the sower was sowing the seed of the Word of God. And so in this parable, there were four types of seeds that were mentioned, which symbolized that four different types of either people or four different types of uh, spiritual growth. So in the first seed, uh, the first seed is the seed that fell by the wayside, along the edges of the field and off the path of the rows and and uh, so the seed was given, and the birds came down and devoured up the seeds. So this type of seed are those who hear the word, and Satan comes along and immediately takes away the seed that was sown in their hearts. So the attack is placed on their, their faith because there wasn't any time given for the seed to take root in their heart. And so the enemy came in and devoured the seed. And so we remember that the seed is the word and the soil is the condition of man's heart. So 
the parable is using nature and applying it in a spiritual application. And so if we, if we look at the, the second seed, so just remember that this seed fell by the wayside. So just remember that part. And so when we look at the, the next slide, it says, uh, and this seed fell among stony ground where there wasn't much earth, so immediately sprung up because there wasn't much depth to the soil in their heart. But when the sun came up, the seed was scorched and because there was no root. So just remember that word, there was no root and it withered away. This type of seed are, are those who immediately receive the word and it seems like they're interested in learning more and sometimes might even seem excited about it. But because there was no root, and there's that uh, key word again, is there was no root to the seed that was planted. So uh, when affliction or persecution and hardships of life come, they're often offended and they just walk away. So uh, we look at the third seed, and I know I'm just kind of rushing through these parables because I know there's just a message just on teaching the parables and um, if you just kind of follow along you'll see where we're headed so um, so this third seed is and some fell among thorns and the seed and the word grew up and the thorns choked so remember that word choked the growth of the word and the seed yielded no fruit so in the beginning we would uh, see some growth but the cares of life, the sinful influence of the world around the seed and, and even our own sinful nature choked the growth of the word and the seed that was planted yielded no fruit or the individual experienced very little spiritual growth. And so when you look at these uh, first three seeds they were all, that were all planted experienced similar fate, like no growth. And, and the word of God that was planted eventually died. So perhaps the problem, we know it's not with the seed because there's nothing wrong with the word of God. Like his word is still the same. It's still as powerful as it was when God spoke it right back in creation. So we know the problem is not, it's not with the word, but the problem is with perhaps the soil, the conditions of man's heart. And so if the, the farmer or the planter, if they had taken the time and invested in the soil and worked with the soil, such as evangelism and discipleship, the outcome could have been much different. So when we look at the, the first three types of soils, like they all experience the same fate. And why? It's because the lack of discipleship in evangelism. So working with those who have struggles in their lives, discipling people when deception arises, working with those and discipling them through when offenses come, because they will come. We've, we can all say, yes, I've, like, you know, things have uh, come against me. <laughs> and we're all human. Like, we're not exempt from life. Like, none of us is exempt from things. And so we all have to... Uh, continually daily work on our own personal lives and and so uh, just understand that there are some who you know just need that little bit extra uh, things and stuff added to the soil and the condition of their hearts and so all three seeds we just discussed were missing one key element so one key element that's missing was discipleship but yet when okay we look at the the next slide is the is the fourth seed and it says, and some seed fell on good ground and experienced growth, which multiplied up to a hundred times of that which was planted. Now that's like, that's, uh, you take one seed and it multiplied up to a hundred times. That's a pretty good, uh, that's pretty good math when you think about it. Like one tiny little seed produced a hundred times that, a hundred times the fruit. And it's about, it's about, building up God's kingdom. And it's about a harvest of souls. And so, and so this type of seed are those who receive 
the word and experience great growth, and they become deeply rooted. So there's a, those are two key words, deeply rooted. And the soil was well prepared. So it, the soil being well prepared meant there was some people who were along the, came along and began to work with the soil, began to work with the person's heart and, and uh, help them work through things and cultivate and discipleship, evangelism. And so we can learn from this parable as it reflects to evangelism and discipleship. So, so what can we learn? Well, we learn that 70%... 75% of the people that God places in our pathway requires mentorship. So what does that mean? Well, it means we need to spend time with them. We need to work with them and help them through the hurdles of life in order for them to reach the true spiritual growth that God desires for them. So as a church, every saint must invest and disciple somebody. So that's not just... Uh, uh, a few, it's not just for the ministerial team. Like every one of us have the responsibility of reaching just one person. And uh, this, is, this is the middle of February. And so if we were to take every single person here and work with just one individual a year from now, we would see this, this church overflowing. So just, just uh, think about it that way. Like we're we're to work with just one person. Just take one person this year and say, God, place someone in my pathway that I can help disciple and mentor this year. Just take the whole year. I'm just going to spend time with them. I'm going to disciple them. And God is going to bring the increase. So, that, uh, so as we help them work through their struggles, that, they're, that they... Uh, they just don't become like another statistic, like one of the seeds that either fell by the wayside or was choked out or, or the sun rose up and it's just scorched it and withered and died. Like, like when you think about that, that just, it sounds, it sounds terrible when we think about it, that, you know, every life matters, every soul matters. It's, it's uh, for the whosoever will, and it's for whoever will desire and go out and reach other people. And so if we don't reach and mentor others, at best, we will see 25% growth. And that's not good enough. Like, we are building up God's kingdom. And yes, God could just snap his fingers and just things will happen. He could just speak the word and lives would be changed. And, uh, but the crazy thing is, God desires to use imperfect people to accomplish his perfect will. And his perfect will is that all should come to a place of repentance. All should experience salvation. Jesus came to save and to save those which are lost. Well, that's humanity. Every one of us is lost or was lost. So we are to, we must all connect with others and lead them to know full life. Discipleship begins after the born-again experience. So after someone's been baptized and filled with the Holy Ghost, this is when we, discipleship begins. We just don't lead them to God and, and uh, share with them the plan of salvation and they follow through and God fills them with the Holy Ghost and we're like, all right, my job was done. We'll see you in heaven and hope you make it between here and there. Like, uh, that's, that whole idea isn't, that's, that's what happens to the first three types of seeds is at some point in time, things happen and life happens and they walk away and that seed dies. So it's discipleship. Discipleship is the, is the key. Discipleship is the key to church growth. Discipleship is the key to seeing God's kingdom expand. And so it begins after the new birth. So it's, it's a, almost like a, a change in church culture where, where, that, uh, where we realize and know that it's, it's after they've experienced new birth that discipleship really begins. Because up until that point, it's really that uh, God leads us to someone, we connect with them as a friend, and then we 
bring that friend into discipleship. And so we look at the, uh, the next slide. It says, uh, our goal is to turn sinners into friends and turn friends into disciples. So turning uh, sinners into friends and then discipling them is an everyday process. It's not uh, uh, Sunday-centric, meaning that we only minister on Sunday. We don't just say, oh, I'm sorry, uh, I only uh, minister to people on Sundays, the rest of the week, I just do my own thing. But it's an everyday process. And every day we connect with those that God has placed on our path. God ordained us to connect with people. And as we've been going through this series of uh, loneliness, we, we've we shared with you the importance of that connection with others. Like, why do we feel lonely? It's because that longing and yearning for that human connection, sometimes that, that need isn't met, and we just experience being lonely. And so God designed us to be connected with people and to be connected with Him, uh, obviously, too. But So it's just God has ordained us to connect with people. And we need to be sensitive to the opportunities that God places across our pathway. And just be ready. Be ready. You know, sometimes it's hard to relate to someone. And uh, especially during their need. And sometimes it's hard to, you know, just kind of break the ice. And one effective way is to use these three steps. It says, uh, before, how, and now. So, this approach helps to break the ice in a way uh, that we can relate and share uh, our experiences. So, for example, like before, uh, before I was dealing with depression, my life was going nowhere, but God delivered me from all those emotional hurts and depression. He set me free through baptism, the infilling of the Holy Ghost, and now my life is better. I have peace and joy, and I no longer live in that emotional prison. You know, that's just, a, just an example. And so you can, have the, you can have the same experience. God wants you and to set you free and fill you with that same peace and joy that we all have. So share your testimony. And remember, sharing your own experiences and real-life situations is an encouragement to those we disciple. So we are to become ambassadors of heaven. So Acts 1 and 8 says, But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me. So witness, testimony. The power of your testimony, sharing what I was before, and how God changed everything, and now, now my life is way different. I talk differently, I dress differently, I carry myself differently, eat at different places. Everything around my life has changed. And, and we, all say, we all can say the same thing. that our, Like when God changed our life, he completely changed our lives. I'm not like I was, but I'm so much better. So be a witness of the power of God in your life. And be, be excited as you share your testimony. You know, if you share it and say, yeah, you know, God really changed my life. I have so much joy inside. I just feel so much joy joy unspeakable you know like uh, you got to think of it this way that you know how many have worked in sales you know and now I'm speaking to everyone just like yes yeah, sales commission cha-ching cha-ching you know like even as a mechanic working flat rate you kind of have to think sales sales <laughs> have to sell this brake job to make some money so but think of it this way that um you know, have I got a deal for you? You know, we can even, you know, spin the wheel. Ding, 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 ding. Oh, look, it's eternal life today. Yours only today. If you just come down and repent and be filled with the Holy Ghost and be baptized in Jesus' name, you too can have the same joy. And I know I'm just messing with you and having fun. But it's to, the idea is, is that you need to present the kingdom of God, that is exciting. Like it really does change your life. Like it really will set you free of things. 
and just the excitement and just knowing, you know what, I am not what I was and just how God has changed me. And look what I am today. It's not because of anything that I've done, but it's all what he has done. And that, people are going to be like, man, I just, I want what they got. I, I kind of want what you got. And so it's all in how you kind of present it, you know, how you present the gospel that, you know, this is what you need. I, you know, I know what you need, but, you know, and just present it in a way that it's exciting. So... Uh, sometimes while we are discipling or mentoring someone, it can be an inconvenience. Oh, no one likes this. Inconvenience. Oh, inconvenience. Oh, inconvenience. Sometimes it's an inconvenience to ourselves and our family. And yes, it's important for us to be perfectly balanced for ministry and family. And uh, I, I know, that that's, I know it, that sometimes that's hard to balance everything. You know, work, ministry, family life. But uh, remember, the goal is to mentor them and disciple them. And it will be at times of an inconvenient, but to make yourself available. So if we go to uh, the next slide. So here uh, in Acts chapter 8, and just verses 26 to 40, I'm not going to read the whole story, but here the Lord uh, instructs Philip to go toward the south from Jerusalem onto Gaza, leading into the desert. And so as Philip was traveling, he came into contact with the Ethiopian eunuch who was reading some scripture in his chariot, but he didn't understand what he was reading. So we're just talking about inconvenience. So here we are. God is speaking to Philip to kind of go out of his way and head south, head right into the desert to meet someone. And so this is a perfect illustration of inconvenience, you know. So, but Philip made himself available. There was no questioning God. It's okay, God, this is, you're asking me, I'm gonna, just going to be your humble servant, and I'm just, I'm going to go. And so God led him to this Ethiopian eunuch. And so the Lord instructed Philip to join this man in his chariot. So this, this complete stranger, like he didn't have time to introduce himself and flash off his fancy little card that says, you know, I'm a member of the UPC organization and show off his credentials of Bible college. He just climbed up into the chariot and he began to... Uh, interpret or share the meaning of the scriptures because it's it's not enough to say well i've i've read the bible and you know i know i know about god but i don't know god and so that's two different things like knowing about god and and knowing god is is not the same and so and so that as we read that the rest of the story we find that the eunuch he was baptized and his life was changed, and then instantly Philip was carried away 20 miles away. So can you imagine God asking someone to go out of the way and head in the opposite direction, right into the desert, not knowing why at the time? You know what? Sometimes God will do the same for us. And sometimes it's even in the most convenient time, inconvenient time. But be obedient and make yourself available, and the miraculous will take place. Just say, God, you've, I don't know the whole details. I will go. Like, God doesn't give us the whole picture of things. Sometimes it's just, I just need you to go. Sometimes it's, I just need you to be walking down the street at this right, uh, at the right time, and someone will bump into you, and you, it just spark into a conversation. Sometimes it'll end up, you'll be praying for someone right on the street. Like, meeting them right where the need was, and just being sensitive to the Spirit of God. And so be obedient. Make yourself available. And so we'll just go to the next slide. So, when discipling, there's times when we will face different obstacles. So I'm not saying, like, you're joining an obstacle course, but there are some, some things that we will have to work through. 
And so in John chapter 4, verses 1 to 42, there's an incredible story in this, in this uh, passage of Scripture. So we find that Jesus was leaving Judea and was headed back to Galilee, and Jesus went out of his way to reach a Samaritan woman. So we, we look at it and say, okay, well, it, that seems okay. It seems, you know, kind of normal, I guess. Meets a woman at a well. Maybe Jesus was thirsty and just needed a drink. But what we don't really think about is that Jesus had to step through hate, racism, uh, uh, discrimination, prejudice, and different cultures and beliefs to reach this woman. Whoa. So, uh, so during this time, the Jews hated the Samaritans and, and vice versa. But Jesus felt compelled to travel through this unpopular region in order to reach Galilee. This would have placed Jesus and his disciples in a very uh, awkward position with the Samaritans. But Jesus had a mission. Remember that. Jesus had a mission, so we have to have a mission. And the mission is souls. And so it was to reach this woman at the well, Jacob's well. And so Jesus brings a salvation message to her and the other people that were living in that area. And so Jesus and his message of salvation was received very well, as many received by hearing the word only. So when you read towards the end of the, the passage of Scripture, you'll find that Jesus never performed any miracles those few days in Samaria. So you're like, well, that's, that's different because it seems like everywhere he goes, there was miracles that were happening, healings were taking place. And, and so uh, how come the Samaritans didn't receive it? But it's because... They believed by the word only. You know, Jesus didn't have to give them signs and miracles to, to get them to believe. They just believed just by his word only. And so sometimes, sometimes we need to go out of our way to reach someone who God is calling. And sometimes it means that we have to be willing to work through culture uh, differences. And so sometimes it's helpful to study and understand different cultures. For example, if you were to go visit uh, a, a family that was, uh, uh, was, is Muslim, for example, it's, it would be a custom to bring them some uh, uh, a sweet dish that's called baklava. Like it would be, like if you were to do that, like you automatically, they would just greet you and accept you. And so study and understand people's cultures. And... Uh, so there's times when you're going to have to work through different cultures. You're going to have to sometimes work through discrimination, uh, racist teaching. Sometimes people have a preconceived ideas um, about the church or even God. And there's times when we will have to work through that. Or there's sometimes people will say, well, that's what you guys believe and I believe this. And, and so sometimes we have to navigate our way through those ideas because the end, the, our, our goal was to uh, disciple them, that, that they come to understand and live a full life. So sometimes uh, we will encounter someone who has developed some kind of a preconceived idea about the church, and so we just need to work with them through these differences and, and establish common ground. Je Jesus did it many times, and we should too as a church. So remember, we can't get them to the holy ground until we pass through common ground. So we need to establish a common ground before they can even experience holy ground. And remember that this is the most important thing, if you can remember anything, is we always reach out in love. It's love that's going to win them. It's love that's going to have them open up. And so if we go to the uh, next slide. God called us to be fishers of men. So this is what we need to know. We need to know, one, what kind of fish you are fishing. And two, we need to know what kind of lure to use for what kind of species to fish. 
So Jesus would use the analogy of comparing like fishing to becoming fishers of men. So when fishing, it's important to be equipped with the right kind of fishing gear or equipment. So how many out there uh, do fishing? I'm sure a lot of people, that they know this, the perfect spot and they know just the perfect lure to use and what kind of bait to use for certain species of fish. And so you wouldn't, uh, like you wouldn't show up using a macro jig if you're going to be, you know, fishing trout. It's just, it's probably not going to work. So understand that you need to be equipped with the right kind of gear when you're fishing. So fishing with the wrong lure could be the difference of whether you are successful or not. So know what lure to use for the fish you are trying to catch. So to catch all different species of fish, you will need different types of lures. So know that what works for one person may not work for another. So the way that we uh, discipled one person, you may not be able to use the same approach or the same tactic or this, the same way that every person is unique. So we have to be adaptable and flexible to match uh, those who we are trying to connect with. One thing that will never change is the gospel message. The message can never change. And nor can it ever change. But our methods have to be adaptable, especially if we're going to reach different cultures and different nations. The Great Commission is... Teach all nations. Disciple all nations as God leads us to them. And so we, we are going to have to understand who, who am I reaching, who am I discipling, and what, what type of lure am I going to use. So I challenge each one of us to just connect with one person this year, and spend time with them, and God will lead you to uh, who to mentor. Take the time and invest into them. So the greater the investment, the greater the dividend. Just remember, like, some seed fell on good soil, produced a 30-fold, 60-fold, and a 100. So the greater the investment, the greater the dividend. So in conclusion tonight, uh, I know over this session and the last session I threw a lot of information but it's all valuable and it will help us to learn how to reach someone it's more than just going up and say um, do you want a bible study that approach doesn't I've tried it like on Waterloo Street and Tim Hortons and you know it they're just like yeah can I get a free coffee you know that's that's uh and that's as far as it went but if you start to connect with them and say, hey, you know what? I know what you're going through, and I know the answer. I know something that will help you that will last more than just a few hours or next week, but it'll last you through all the way through to eternity. And it's like, oh, what's that? And it's Jesus. And uh, so, just, um, so just taking uh, what we know and put it into practical use. So we need to learn the practical side of discipleship. And it only comes through experience. And the only way to get experience is to just jump in and do it. And yes, uh, we're all going to make mistakes. Uh, I've made some mistakes. Um, but that's how we learn. We learn through mistakes. And, uh, and that's all part of the learning aspect. So I challenge everyone to connect with one person this year. And invest in that relationship. Cultivate the soil. Sometimes it might have to help them remove some of the stones from the soil. We've got to keep the soil moist with the word. And, as, and we as a church will see the true growth as God has ordained. Jesus said the harvest field is ready. And where are the laborers? You know, we thank the Lord for the harvest that he wants to bring in our city. And so if every one of us just take a hold of 
the person that is sitting next to them, your family, and just say, I'm going to stretch myself to reach one person this year. You know, and that's something I'll, you know, stretch. You know, I know when like, oh, stretch. Oh. Sometimes the word, like, the word stretch means God is going to kind of make me a step beyond the borders of comfort. And uh, it's easy to stay in the comfort. But God, he wants us to launch out a little bit further than just our comfort zone. And God, God's going to stretch us. But he's not going to leave us alone. He's not going to leave us hanging. But he's going to, as we stretch, God is going to continue to equip us where, uh, with those, the skills and things that are needed. And so um, tonight I just want to challenge every one of us that it's, it's our spiritual obligation to reach people. You know, if, if, we're not, if we're not reaching souls, then we are breaking the Great Commission. We go and teach all nations. Go and make disciples. If we're not, if we're not reaching souls, then, then we ourselves, we're, we're sinning. And, um, and so it's, it's about souls. It's about people's lives. Yes, there's times when... Um, it's, as I shared, it's, uh, it's an inconvenience at times. But realize and know that the bottom line is it's about their soul. And if we can be the bridge for them to reach Christ, then we need to be the bridge. Like they're going to have to step through some troubled waters. And as we mentor and disciple, we're going to help them through it. We're not just going to say, oh, yeah, over here. Oh, you didn't quite make it. They drowned. No, we're going to step through it with them. We're going to help them through the troubled waters and be the bridge for, um, for them to experience full life. And so that's the, that's the mission of the church is to know the way, know the truth, and to live full life. Like, I th- did, you know, hopefully we haven't forgot what our vision is. You know, it says, without a vision, the people will perish. Without a vision, we will um, we'll all just fall way, way short for what God desires. And God has orchestrated and put in place lighthouses all over the city. So that the harvest is ready. So where... Where's the laborers? Where are those who are willing to say, I'll go, I'll go, I'll go beyond the confinements and the comforts of the church, and I'm going to go into uncharted waters, and I'm going to reach one person this year. If you could just, uh, if you have your Bibles beside you or your notepad beside you, if you could just uh, set it down right now, and we're just going to lift our hands, and we're all going to just make this declaration, and we're going to commit ourselves before, the, before God Almighty. Lord Jesus, God, right now, Lord, as we are gathered together, Lord, maybe not together in the sanctuary, but God, just digitally, Lord, we are binding together, Lord, for one cause and one, for one purpose, and that's to disciple. That's to evangelize. That's to bring the gospel to our city, to those that we are connected day in and day out. God, I pray, Lord, that that you would just put it, that it's such a, a burning conviction in our spirit that it's it's about souls, that it's it's about the kingdom of God. And Lord, that you want to advance, God. Lord, that you want to bring a harvest to souls. You want to bring a revival to our cities, Lord, to our, our province and to our nations, oh God. Lord, across the globe, Lord, there is a revival that's going to happen happen, Lord. And Lord, it comes through your people. And God, prepare us, Lord. Prepare us right now, God. 
Give birth in us, Lord. Lord, the desire, Lord, that we, we feel the urgency within our spirit that we must reach. We must reach those around us. We must reach those that, God, you place in our pathway, Lord, that we can connect with, oh God. Lord, and help us, Lord, to push through some of the obstacles. God, help us, Lord, to bring us an understanding, Lord, as we navigate and work our way through, through cultures, God. Lord, as we work through, Lord, some barriers, Lord, and God, help us, Lord. Help the church, God, be the bridge, Lord. Be the bridge so souls, souls can experience, Lord, salvation. That they can experience full life. They can experience, Lord Jesus, God. Lord, that what we have inside us, Lord. Lord, that they can have joy unspeakable. They can have that peace in their lives, God. Equip us, Lord. Lord, and birth in us, God. Lord, a desire, Lord. A desire, Lord. That is an urgency within our spirit, we pray. And God, we pray, Lord, for all of the pastors of our daughter works. I pray, God, Lord, Lord, that you would continue to use them, Lord, and lead them, God, to keep people in our city, God. Lord, that it would spring forth, God. Lord, we think of the lower west side, God. Lord, there needs to be, God. Lord, a lighthouse, Lord. And we thank you, God, for what you're doing. But, Lord, there's, there's so many, God, that need, that need what we have. And help us, Lord. To reach them, we pray, all across our city. Grand Bay, Chris Bam, Sis, God. We pray, Lord, that you would, God, Lord, that you would use our pastors, Lord, those, those churches, Lord. Lord, that they feel a, something give birth inside of them, God, that I must reach. I must go. I must go to the people down the street. I must go down the street. I must reach my neighbors. I must reach those around me. Hallelujah. Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's about souls. It's about reaching. It's about making disciples, mentoring. And I, I honestly can say that, that I, I wouldn't be the minister. I wouldn't be the, the man that I am today if it wasn't for the fact that one person saw in me so many years ago the potential. And I'm so thankful that someone took the time and invested in me. And God wants you to do the same. Invest. Invest somebody's life. Invest in somebody's soul. Because there's way too much at stake. There's somebody's lives are, are very hinged on, on somebody reaching them. Eternity is forever. There's only one of two places that our soul will rest. It'll either be in heaven or it'll be in hell. There's no, there's no in between. And so it's our responsibility. It's our spiritual obligation to go and to reach, to reach all nations, push through, push through all the different obstacles that we must have to, that we have to work through. But God will help us navigate. He'll help us navigate if we are sensitive to his spirit and we, when we want to, we desire it. So tonight I challenge each and every one of us to, to go and just make one disciple this year. Hallelujah. Go and evangelize the world around us. Go and make disciples. That's what Jesus said. His last final words was, go make disciples. And that's what I leave with you tonight is, go make disciples. Evangelize the world. No one asking you to travel across the world, but just evangelize the world around you. Evangelize your own world. Evangelize those who surround you. You know, those that we see every day as we go through the drive through hand us our coffee every morning with a smile. Evangelize them. Evangelize. It's about evangelism. It's about discipleship. So I just thank you for this opportunity to share with you. And uh, feel free to uh, respond with, with uh, some comments and let us know if there's anything more that the church can do for you. And, and just know that this church loves you and we support you. And, uh, you know, we will do whatever we can to help you in, in any way. And know that ultimately God loves you. And he's reaching out to you right now. There's someone tonight that's 
been listening and and uh, just know that you know God's been you know he's been knocking at the door of your heart and just if you just open your heart up to him it'll make the very difference in your life if he can do it for me he'll do it for anyone you know his word says that he's not a respecter of persons he doesn't show any favoritism at all and he loves us all the same and he he gives us that grace and he gives us the same amount of mercy and so tonight I I just want to thank you for this opportunity and and uh, just continue to watch our uh, different sessions on Tuesdays Thursdays and Saturdays and and uh, if you're enjoying them please um, like and share and and maybe just give us some feedback and just let us know uh, how you like the sessions and if there's any future topics that you would like us to discuss, feel free to share that with us, and we can make those available to you in, in the future. And Ultimately, this, the church just wants to help. You know, we just want to help people. And uh, so I just want to thank you once again, and we're just going to close in a word of prayer. And Jesus, God, we just thank you, Lord, for this opportunity, Lord, that, Lord, that we can put to practical use what you've laid out in your word. Jesus, and I pray tonight and in God that you would just continue to minister and to touch and to encourage those, Lord Jesus. And God, we just pray for what you are desiring to do, Lord, this year, even through a pandemic, God. Like, as we have declared it, that you are unstoppable. Nothing can stop the move of God. And Lord, we just want to be part of what you were doing. And God, as you move, as you move, as your spirit moves and ministers, we as a church want to move with you. Just as the children of Israel had followed the pillar of fire, the pillar of cloud, as, as God had moved, the church wants to move with you, Lord. And God, and I just pray for each and every one tonight, Lord, that you would just continue to Move in their lives, Lord Jesus, we pray. And God, we thank you for what you're doing. And we anticipate a great harvest this year. And God, we just love you. Lord, we just love you. Hallelujah. Can we just love him for one last moment and just lift our hands? Jesus, hallelujah. God, we love you. Lord, you're so good to your people. Oh, hallelujah. Jesus, Lord. Jesus. Jesus' name. Thank you once again for... Uh, watching with us this evening, and God bless.